told. Oh, and here's your drink, sir. Like the one you saw in the magazine. Well, you got the bamboo umbrella and everything. See that? Be somebody. <laughs> Very good, sir. Very good. Oh, uh, there's some charity people here to see you, sir. No! Send them away! There's a lot of people more deserving than me. Ah, but these people want you to give. Oh. Okay. My name is Father Carlos Las Vegas de Cordova. Father, you seem like a religious man. How can I help you? By giving me three minutes of your time so that you can see some film of a great ugliness that is spreading in my country. Oh, God. I'll bet it's disgusting. Hobart? Yes, sir? Are you over your grief enough yet to dim the lights? Oh, of course, sir. Well, one can't mourn forever. You will not believe what you are about to see. That human beings could have sunk so low that they can take pleasure to do this to another of God's creatures. I hope you have a strong stomach, senor. Roll the ugliness. Lord, I've heard about this cat juggling. be a god that would let this happen how much do you want wow good morning hope welcome my name is eli sudarth i'm one of our ministers here in ankeny um that's the comedy of the late 70s so uh no offense is meant to any ethnic group or nationality uh no actual cats were harmed in the making of the movie uh which is the jerk uh boys and girls that's not a nice name to call anybody uh, I think all my bases are covered, but you can still send angry emails if you want to. Uh, Steve Martin plays Navin Johnson, who is kind of a rags-to-riches story in this movie. He has an invention that makes him an overnight success. He makes millions of dollars, and he struggles to figure out what is he supposed to do with all of this money that he never really had before. And so he entertains these charitable ideas, and he starts accumulating all this stuff. And uh, money isn't something that we often talk a lot about at, at Hope, um, and there's good reasons for that, but a big one is, is because we are, are simply grateful as a church. Um, last night, if you came to our budget meeting, which uh, I know you didn't because there are only 15 of us there, <coughs> it's not too late though, we, we haven't, the budget will be approved at the council or the next church meeting on September 18th, so mark your calendar, circle that really big. Um, but last night at our budget meeting, it was, you know, really a moment of gratitude uh, that you are an incredibly generous and faithful church with your resources. Uh, we are grateful as a church that you continue to support the mission that is going on here and our missions partners here and around the world. Um, and, and we trust that, that your, your finances are between you and God, and we're, we're just simply glad that we get to be a part of doing the church together in every possible way. Now, but we also realize that, that finances are important. Uh, the Bible actually talks about this, 2,300 150 verses in the Bible that deal with how to uh, deal with your finances and your material resources, kind of that biblical word stewardship and what that really means. And so because it's so important, we offer classes like this. We're going to be offering the Crown Financial Bible Study starting in October. Emily mentioned the, the catalog. You can grab the catalog uh, or find this on our website and register for this class if this is an area of your life where you feel like you might uh, be struggling or want to take a closer look at, what does the Bible say about how I can get better at stewarding the resources that God gives to me? 
my wife and I actually took Crown when we were first married. It's been around for a long time. Um, and when we were first married, we took this because it really helped uh, kind of establish our early relationship on these biblical principles for how to steward our resources. But we didn't really have a, a whole lot to list uh, at the time. Uh, the way that Crown talks about stewardship comes from Psalm verse, or chapter 24, verse 1. Uh, it's on the screen. Let's read this together out loud. The earth is the Lord and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And that's kind of the, the, the foundation that crown builds off of. And really the whole Bible talks about what stewardship means is that all of the, the blessings that we have, whether they're financial or material or, or otherwise, they, they, they are gifts from God. That we don't actually own them. They don't belong to us. Stewardship means that God has given them to us for a season, for some time, to take care of, to make sure that we are responsible with those things. And it may not be financial. For, for my wife and I, when we were starting out, there wasn't a lot. Um, we were both uh, were making our, our living doing music. I was working at a church, and she was, and is still is a music therapist. So um, obviously, the, the list of financial resources was not that long. But one of the early exercises that Crown has you do, just to give you, you know, kind of a glimpse into the first couple of sessions, you fill out what they call a quit claim deed. And that sounds awfully formal, but it's just an exercise for you and your family. No one else sees it. The leader doesn't see it. And you simply list out the assets that you have, you know, whether it's material or financial or otherwise. You list out the things that God has given you to steward, and then you kind of sign it away and recognize that that belongs to God, and I'm just supposed to take care of it. And so when we were listing things, our, our leader said, well, you can get creative. Get creative with all the ways that, that you feel like God has blessed you. So even though the finances wasn't, you know, that long of the list, we realized, well, we have these musical instruments, and that's how we're making our living. So if we don't take care of these things, if we don't steward them well, then we might be in some trouble. Not only did we have instruments, but we had hands and fingers to play them. That We had, you know, healthy lungs and vocal cords and, and bodies that we're supposed to steward and take care of really well. Uh, we had transportation. Each of us had a car to get us from our house to our work. And we had a house. We had an apartment that we were living in. And um, we had a dog who was way more of a liability than an asset. Um, <laughs> but we're still supposed to steward him. And we tried our best. And on and on, we kept listing the things that we felt like God had blessed us with. And what we realized is that we were incredibly wealthy, that, that God had made us very rich. In not, maybe not in the way that, that we might think of it. You know, in our part of the world, it's pretty easy to look around and say, well, I'm not wealthy. You know, I don't have that kind of house or that kind of car or that kind of job. Those people are wealthy, but I'm not. You know, if that's where you're feeling, you know, this doesn't make any sense to you. But um, if you were to zoom out just a little bit, take more of a global perspective and discover the, the ways that the majority of the world actually lives and the things that they're blessed with and steward, uh, it changes perspective a little bit. And so some of these older statistics that I actually go back to anytime I'm feeling uh, less than grateful for the things that I have, they stand out to me. So uh, if you made uh, $1,500 last year, you're automatically in the top 20% of income earners in the world. Global population. I think I made more than that in high school, changing oil at Dusty's Tire in Iowa City. Uh, $25,000 a year, and that puts you in the top 10% of the world. Here's an interesting one. If you have money saved, any money in the bank that's not for spending, uh, a hobby that requires supplies or equipment like fishing or uh, woodworking or art or music, uh, a variety of clothes in your closet, two cars that are in any condition, uh, if you live in your own home, whether it's renting or owning it, uh, then you're in the top 5% of the wealthiest people in the world. And if you make $50,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of the world's wealth by global population. Now, I know that this is a dynamic thing. Uh, contextualization matters a lot. You know, the cost of living in the United States is a lot different than uh, the Middle East or Southeast Asia or different parts of the world. Uh, taxes and government structures, it's, it's all very complex. But this really does shift perspective to what it means to be blessed, to, to understand stewardship. And we have a lot that God is entrusting to us to take care of and to be responsible with. And that's a big part of what it means to look into the Bible and say, well, how am I supposed to take care of the things that God has given me and, and use them for his purposes? But then also to have the opportunity to maybe put myself in a position where I might see how most of the world actually lives, uh, to, to see things from their point of view, to gain that perspective. Um, and that's what I did uh, recently. So one of my roles here at Hope is I'm our, our outreach pastor or something like that, whatever my title is. Um, <clears throat> 
handling missions and outreach projects, but also a lot of our trips. And I work with all of our campuses to take teams on short-term missions trips. Uh, last weekend, we just got back. Um, I helped, I helped lead a team of eight to El Salvador. And we were working there with our missions partner, Enlace. Uh, they're a local agency in El Salvador. They partner with local churches uh, and local organizations and, and communities to, to do you know, projects and build up their church structure there. So we went down and we partnered with them for a week um, on some projects in a community there. Really got a chance to experience you know, the world from, from their perspective, from their point of view. Um, to, to build relationships and to invest in their community, uh, to see how they live and to uh, celebrate with them together as a global body of Christ, as the church. Um, if, if you've ever wanted to go on a missions trip, please talk to me. I'd like to get you uh, plugged into that. Um, and we do a lot of training before we send anybody. You know, we don't just put you on a plane and expect you to figure it out once you're there. Uh, every team we have go through uh, some pretty rigorous training months in advance, and then in Lasse does it too if you go with them. It all combines to really give us the sense when we go that, that we are not there for us that we're not coming in as some kind of a savior who's there to solve problems as though we could in seven days. You know, that it's not really about us. It's about discovering what God is already doing wherever you might go, that he's already there working with the church and the community to, to impact lives, to make disciples, to transform things for his kingdom. And it's our job to learn, to experience, and to celebrate with that local community. So it's not about us. And we keep reinforcing that over and over and over again. It's not about us. And for as much as we tried to make it not about us, um, because the project we were working on involved the mayor's office and a city council and a bunch of different organizations, uh, two national news organizations came to where we were working on the second day, and uh, we, we accidentally made the, uh, the national news in El Salvador while we were there. Um, so we found some of the clips that they used, and just to give you a glimpse of what we were up to, uh, here is what they ran on the news in El Salvador. Los de la ONG Enlace llegaron hasta la comunidad del Castaño para dar inicio a la construcción de 25 letrinas, con las cuales se pretende beneficiar a familias de escasos recursos en esta zona costera. Este día se inicia con el grupo que ha venido como voluntario, que son los donantes de la iglesia Lutheran Church, y ellos han venido para poder ayudar a la ejecución el día de hoy lunes 15 hasta el día jueves. Los beneficiados agradecieron esta iniciativa ya que aseguran que desde mucho tiempo atrás han necesitado este beneficio, el cual este día se hizo posible. Bastante bendecidos primeramente por Dios, agradecidos este, con Dios, con eh, el señor alcalde, el consejo, todos los que andan ahí trabajando verdad, con él, eh, luego también la institución Enlace, y ahí el grupo de los hermanos americanos que andan también, una bendición grande. Eh, sentimos bien contentos, agradecidos con Dios, porque es un gran beneficio, un gran beneficio que hemos recibido de parte de ellos. El alcalde Adin Cetino se mostró agradecido con esta ONG por la ayuda brindada a las comunidades de escasos recursos en el municipio de San Francisco Menéndez. Además, detalló que en este proyecto la municipalidad ha brindado una contrapartida. Agradecerle también a este grupo de americanos que vienen a, a donarnos no solo materiales, vea, sino también a donarnos el trabajo de la mano de obra. La alcaldía municipal, el consejo municipal, pues gracias a Dios también pone su grano de arena, vea, donde nosotros pues damos una contrapartida, arriba de 5 mil dólares, casi 6 mil dólares, eh, la ayuda que se está dando, vea, donde es manejado el dinero prácticamente por las comunidades. En los próximos días se espera terminar con este proyecto. El alcalde Adin Cetino además estará brindando mano de obra para la construcción de un dispensario médico en esta comunidad. Con imágenes de Ernesto Alguera, Jonathan Orellana, Noticiero Hechos. Uh, conveniently we couldn't find the clip where they tried to interview me in Spanish. I don't know what happened to it. It's out there somewhere.
that just gives you a glimpse of, of some of the things that we were up to while we were there. And I wanted to report back to you uh, as a church because you are, a, a, again, a financial contributor to Enlace. Um, when you uh, give your resources to the church, a portion of that every year goes to our missions board and they distribute resources to our missions partners. Um, again, we do that because they know better how to interact with their community and we trust them um, to be able to use those funds well. Uh, so they know your name, you know, and Lasse knows Lutheran Church of Hope, and they're grateful. Uh, this church that we were partnering with, Mount Olive's Church, uh, and Pastor Mario and his family, they, they know Lutheran Church of Hope, and they are grateful. Um, one of the ways that Enlace uses to identify what communities, what churches, what projects to work on, uh, their model is, is Bible-based. They, they look at the life of Jesus, and they ask the question, how did Jesus do ministry when he was alive? And if we follow Jesus, if he is our example, then we should be able to do the same thing in our lives. And so one of the stories that Jesus has in Scripture, in Mark chapter 10, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Mark 10. We spent a lot of time looking at this while we were there because it's an example, again, of how Jesus did ministry and that we want to pattern ourselves after, not just uh, on trips, but, but every day when we're doing ministry, even here in our own church, what did Jesus do and how can we do it the same way? So in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 46, this is what it says. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him over. So they called the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you and throwing his cloak aside. He jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. And two things stand out to me about how Jesus does ministry that I think we can apply to our church or anytime we're doing uh, service for other people or with other people, more importantly. And the first one is simply that Jesus took the time to actually stop what he was doing, to, to, to stop paying attention just to his destination or his goals or his objectives, and to be distracted by somebody on the side of the road who needed help. That he was willing to put his destination aside to listen to somebody else who needed his help. Now, in Mark chapter 10, this is actually when Jesus is going with his disciples to Jerusalem, and he is about to be executed. They're on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. He's about a week away from his death, and he knows where he's going. He knows what's about to happen. And I don't know about you, but if, if that was me, I would be awfully preoccupied with that. I would be thinking about my destination and just even making it there. Certainly would not be able to hear somebody calling out for help from the side of the road. But here is Jesus at the end of his life, making sure that he's still taking time to, to notice somebody else. When my wife and I were um, listing our assets, when we were doing Crown early in our marriage, one of the things that we thought of was time. Time. The, that God has given us time to, to steward, to take care of. And there is only so much of it. Um, the uh, average adult has about 500 to 600,000 hours of time. And that doesn't sound like a lot to me, especially because a lot of that were asleep. You know, the waking hours that you and I are gifted by God to take care of is finite. How are you doing stewarding the time that God has given you, blessed you with? Do, do you see it as, as a gift and something that you're caring for, or is it... Maybe working against you. I, I find it interesting, too, how um, the same language that we use for money, we use for time, right? You think about some of those, those phrases or idioms that we can, we can spend time, we can make time, we can save time, we can waste time. Time is money. We take paid time off. Um, we can even kill time. And God forbid we would do that to, to a resource that God has blessed us with. How are we doing stewarding the time that we have? Do we find ourselves more often preoccupied with our destination, our goals, our agenda, where we're going? So much so that we won't take the time to spend it on somebody else. 
a couple of weeks ago, or actually just last week, Pastor Scott was preaching and um, he, he preached a little bit about the devil, which again is another topic we really don't talk that much about. Um, but when he was speaking, it made me think of this anonymous quote as a way of kind of understanding how the devil can influence your life. He doesn't have much power, but this quote I think rings true to me. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. He'll keep us preoccupied, focused our time and attention on on things that aren't of eternal significance. One of my go-to phrases, I think, for this, or a way of talking about time that it relates to how we spend it, um, is the phrase, paying attention. Jesus paid attention to Bartimaeus, and attention costs something. That's why you have to pay attention. It might cost resources or finances, but it definitely costs time to pay attention to other people, other things, healthy distractions that God might be putting just off to the side of your path. And if I had to sum up what we were doing in El Salvador, it'd be that. We were, we were just paying attention. Yeah, we had a project that we were working on and we were doing stuff that we really didn't know what we were doing, but, but we were paying attention to a part of the world where most people don't pay attention to. And if you hear any news that comes out of El Salvador, it's definitely not this good news of the things that God is doing there. And we were paying attention even to a community whose own country really doesn't focus on them that much. They don't get a lot of news crews in the the village of El Castaño. We were just paying attention and building relationships and and focusing on people who, who needed help, who were calling out from the side of the road. Can you help? One of the critiques or the criticisms of, of doing short-term missions trips like this, um, that's what they're called, is, you know, it costs us money to go, right? It, 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 plane tickets cost money, lodging, food for us, uh, transportation around the country, that all costs money. And one of the criticisms usually is, wouldn't it be a better use of that money just to write a check and send that to them, right? How much do you need? And instead of sending eight Americans and wasting that money, if you wanted to think of it that way, why not just give it to them and they can do better with it, right? Well, that's paying money, but that isn't necessarily paying attention, is it? And sometimes we confuse those two things. Jesus actually calls this out. There was a moment when uh, he was experiencing the same criticism of his own ministry. In Matthew 23, he's talking to a group of religious leaders and he says this, "'Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites!' You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So what Jesus is saying here is that it's a good thing to give resources, to give finances. The the word that we use in church, tithe, is giving a tenth. One tenth of what we have is a tithe. And Jesus is saying, that's okay, you should keep doing that. But don't let that be an excuse for not paying attention to the more important matters of the law. Sometimes I think we can even get into the mindset of, I I would rather give some money, but not my attention. I I will use some resources or some offerings and donate, but I won't give myself. We can use our financial offerings as a way to keep people at arm's length, to try and love from a distance. And Jesus is saying what's more important The more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness, relationships, getting into a relationship, a community with people, spending that time, paying attention. So it's a both and. Yes, we need our resources to pay attention to the things that God is calling us to give to, but we also need to pay attention to how he's calling us to be with people. So what we were really doing in El Salvador wasn't just projects for people. We were there for the people themselves to build those relationships. So so I am am more than glad to, to to, to give financially to our church. My wife and I are happy to do that, excited about it. We are more than glad even to to give directly to Enlace, especially because they have this awesome program where you can sign up on their website to send some money and they will send you a bag of Salvadorian coffee every month. It's really good coffee. It's a great way, too, to build relationships because that's giving jobs and all these things. It's a way of forming community, of being close to them. I am more than willing to do that, but I am overjoyed to spend a week with them, walking in their shoes, breathing their air, hearing the sounds of their community, 
talking to them, praying with them, worshiping, singing their songs in their language to our God. If you guys think we play it loud in here, man, they don't have any instruments and it's twice as loud. You can just hear them yelling their praises and there's no, you can't put a price on those experiences. I would encourage everyone to do that because that's really paying attention to the people. You know, the church, God didn't start the church to be a charitable organization. He he started the church to make disciples. And the only way you can make disciples is by building relationships. And that's what we're here to do. So Jesus does this with with Bartimaeus, back to our our Jesus story in in Mark chapter 10. Um, But then he also asks an interesting question when Bartimaeus comes to him. He says in verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? It's kind of an odd question. The answer seems kind of obvious. He's blind. Just heal him, Jesus. Heal him. Get the project done. Get back on the road. On your way. Why even bother taking the time to ask? I I think often in our lives, we we make assumptions about the the needs of others. When, um, When Enlace decides to do a project with a community, months before we even showed up, Uh, They were having meetings with uh, this local church, Mount Olive's church, with their pastors, with the community that was around it, with the city council, the mayor's office, and they were asking, we've got this group of crazy Americans coming down, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? Isn't it amazing that that the all-knowing God of the universe is, is interested in what you have to say? He knows what you need, but he also wants to talk to you about it. He is interested. God is curious about you. He likes to hear from you, the things that are on your heart and on your mind. He is willing to ask you the question, what do you need today? If you've never prayed to God for anything, he encourages you to let him know the things that are on your heart and on your mind. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him. God wants you to talk with him about the things that you need. He is willing to ask the question and to have the conversation because he loves you. He is excited about giving you the good gifts you need so that we can steward them well for his kingdom. So they asked, you know, El Castaño, this community, what do you need? The long list of needs that they have. They live in a way that most of the world does live. What they said is, we really need a sanitary place to, to use restroom facilities, toilets. One of the leading causes of illness and even death in El Salvador are intestinal diseases because of uh, contaminated groundwater, because they don't have sanitary latrines is the word that they use there. And so their water gets contaminated and they get sick and they don't live near a clinic or a hospital and so they can't recover from these diseases. It's a massive health crisis for their country. Now, we would assume, I think coming in, If people are getting sick, we should come in and build a clinic, a hospital, right? People are sick, they need a clinic. That could be our assumption, and that project would sound awfully good on paper, right? That's a sexy project. Building toilets is not a a flashy project to come back home and report about. We built toilets. Now, I know that this isn't a flashy project um, because some of the masons that we worked with these guys were hilarious. So we're working with local masons and builders. Uh, you know, they're getting jobs from this, and we're just having a fun time with each other. Um, they love to play pranks. And Gerardo, who is the mason I worked with all week, he would stay a little bit after we would go home for the day. And one day, he thought it would be hilarious after we had poured this foundation, this pad, to, uh, to engrave my name in the foundation of this latrine where for the next 70 years... The, uh, the stuff will accumulate, and that my name will be memorialized in El Salvador appropriately. <laughs> he thought it was just funny. And we had an awesome time, because we weren't really there to build latrines. We were there to build relationships with Gerardo, or with the, one of the men who they interviewed, Fran. I, I w- this was in his backyard. I was in his backyard every single day, talking to him, playing with his kids. You have to wait for concrete to set up, or for stone to set up, and we would just take breaks and play soccer with kids, and uh, enjoy their community. Y- you know, sit under the shade, because it's really hot there. You know, this is not love. Loving people is a messy job. 
It's not as clean as just sending some, some donations. The way that Jesus loves us is, is messy. God doesn't love us from a distance. He loved us directly. In fact, one of, other, one other of Jesus' miracles when he uh, heals a blind man, different from Bartimaeus, he actually makes mud out of his spit and he rubs it in the man's eyes and that's how he heals him. I'm not going to use that as an example for my ministry. I don't intend to do that uh, unless God really makes it clear that I'm supposed to. But that's what, what, it, what it's meant to call to mind for us is that God created us out of the mud. God got his hands dirty to make us. God gets his hands dirty to heal us, to save us, to redeem us. And he expects his church to get their hands dirty loving people as well. Building relationships is what we're here to do. You know, and it's, it's not something you have to go to a different country to put into practice either. I encourage everyone to do that if it's on your heart to go. I'd love to talk with you about how to get you plugged in now that travel restrictions are opening up. We're able to go on more of these trips to experience these things and to build these relationships around the world. But you don't need to leave even our own town or our own church to serve, to, to put these principles into action. We've been talking about it for months. Um, one of the ministries, the ministries that we are really excited about this fall are, you know, our weekend Hope Kids we're adding a, a fifth service, you know, our Power Life ministry for middle schoolers, our high school ministry, Ignition. All these ministries need leaders, especially men in our church, to help lead young boys. That's where we're really struggling right now. If you were to ask the church, what do we need? We need men to lead young boys so that they can grow up to lead more men and be discipled because that's what the church exists to do. And, and if that's what you would like to do with your time, if you've got some extra time to give, or if you feel like the time you do have is occupied by things you might be able to let go of, that'd be a place where you could serve this fall. And I wonder what might be coming to mind as, as I'm talking and you're thinking of different reasons why you couldn't do something like this, help out with one of these ministries, or, or go on a, a missions trip and experience that. What, what reasons might be coming to mind? Maybe it is that you don't have enough time or you, f you perceive you're too busy. Maybe it's that you feel like you don't have enough expertise or experience. You know, what if, what if one of these kids asks a question I don't know the answer to? Uh, maybe you haven't even been following Jesus that long, and you're like, I don't know enough of the Bible. How could I lead a small group? Uh, I promise you, I really didn't know that much about pouring concrete and laying cinder block before I went to El Salvador. Now I'm really excited about it, actually, um, so much so that my wife is really afraid for our backyard. And she should be. <laughs> I'm going to put a latrine back there. <laughs> I only know how to make one thing, so. <laughs> put my hand, kids' handprints in the bottom? No, I won't do that. <laughs> Serving in these ministries isn't about the project. It's about the people, the relationships. If you're an adult in this church, you know things that our students and our kids can benefit from. They need a relationship with an adult who help, can help guide them through, you know, these are not easy seasons of life if you remember back to when you were a young person. And maybe somebody came alongside you and really helped shepherd and guide you in your faith. And you can offer that to somebody else. And we can help train you. you know, we, we won't just throw you out there and with, with no training. But God can definitely use you here in this church and in our neighborhood and in our community, in this area, as long as you might be willing to let go of some things. Again, paying attention costs something. What, what might you be holding on to that you feel like is preventing you from being able to do that ministry or that trip or that thing for God? Are, are there things that you feel like are more important than what God might be calling you to do? Um, Navin Johnson loses all of his money almost as fast as he made it in the movie, uh, and he discovers that, that he has an awful hard time letting go. Um, he, he really liked the stuff. All the stuff that he had, he really liked. And it was really hard for him to let go of it to pay attention to more important relationships in his life. So one more really goofy clip. It's supposed to be funny. Please laugh. Um, but I, I watch this and see if some of it might seem a little familiar to you in your life. Let's take a look. And I don't need any of this. I don't need this stuff. And I don't need you. I don't need anything. Except this. This ashtray. And that's the only thing I need is this. I don't need this or this. This, this ashtray. This paddle game. The ashtray and 
tray and these matches and the remote control and the paddle ball. This lamp. That's all I need. One of the songs that they sing in El Salvador um, in Spanish that uh, has stuck with me the last couple of weeks, um, it translates something like, I may be poor in this world, but I am rich in Jesus. And they're able to sing that with a tremendous power and volume. Because for them, it's true. Um, you know, when they say, all I need is Jesus, they, they mean it because he is quite literally, all they might have. And they have this tremendous faith in him that he is going to care for them. He is going to watch over them. He is going to give them the good gifts that they need for their lives. And sometimes in my own life, I think I worry for myself that the opposite might be true, that I might be rich in this world but poor in Jesus because I don't really need him to meet my needs. I store up for myself things that I can accumulate on my own, and, and I have a hard time letting go of them sometimes. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. All the things that God has given us to steward, these good things, these gifts that we take care of, even time itself one day won't be here. In eternity, when we enter into that with God, time won't exist. The things that we had won't be there. But our relationships, these treasures will be. How we love God and how we love other people, those are the eternal things, the things of eternal significance that God wants us to invest our time and our resources in. So I can become rich in Jesus not by holding on to the things that I think should occupy my time and my resources. I can become rich in Jesus by looking for ways to invest in more relationships, finding more ways that I can love other people and walk alongside them, not just doing things for them, but, but doing life with them, building relationships and making disciples the way that Jesus did. There's all kinds of opportunities to do that. So I'm really excited for what we have coming this fall. Uh, I hope you are too. I hope you find a way for, um, for you to become rich in Jesus this fall, taking some, a class like Crown or uh, serving in one of our ministry areas or continuing to come to weekend worship. You have invested an hour of your time just doing this, and that's an amazing, amazing investment of time. It's a beautiful thing to worship together, to be the church together. So I want to invite you to stand, and we're going to close in prayer. The worship team is going to lead us in one more song. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this time, uh, for this community, for these relationships, these eternal things that we get to invest in and see uh, your handiwork here in our church, in our community, and all over the world. God, continue to open our eyes to the needs of others. Um, help each one of us. Help me uh, to be able to be distracted from my own agenda and plans so that I can pay attention to the needs of other people. Uh, I pray for us to continue to grow stronger, to be more rich in you by storing up treasures in heaven as a church together. Give us the opportunity to do that. Open our eyes to see those needs. And thank you, God, that we get to be a part of a community that's doing this together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.